Should we call it the ball for the smooth running of that institution? And yet, what do I find? That there's a supervisor in HQ who's actually um, operating the grievance procedure. And where do I, oh, sorry, in this case, disciplinary procedure, but I'm not even part of it. So I think that's one of the, if, if there is a message, I think there are many messages in this particular incident. In this case, he was not, and it was a he, he was not part of the disciplinary procedure. He actually took action, which is what I'm describing to you, undermined uh, the formal disciplinary procedure. And he wasn't thanked <laughs> by the LEA for doing that. <laughs> If one extends it, in this case we're talking about dinner ladies, but if we t extend it across to teaching staff and so on, uh, the so-called incompetent teacher, and you begin to give them uh, counselling advice. When does counselling stop and disciplinary action, uh, when is it appropriate? And actually making those kinds of judgments. And Ken's earlier point, you know, if you haven't got any records of those, of those interventions, of those actions that you've taken to try and help a particular, I'm using the example of teacher, then you really are exposing yourself as head teachers, as managers, if you become before a court of law. And time and time again, they've been exposed in that way. Okay, if we can just draw it to a close, finally, I know I've said that before, um, but I think what we seem to be agreed in saying is that Yes, we should be very conscious of what the law has to say about this. We should be conscious that there are procedures and our role within it. But at the same token, we shouldn't elevate the law or procedures to a position they really don't merit in the conduct of staff relationships. And that's what we're really talking about. And I sense that we have broad agreement on, on those particular points. We do? Splendid then I'll mark your essays at all. <laughs> Thank you very much. The afternoon on two continues with a movie double bill of comedy and drama. In a moment, Will Hay is a bungling Bobby in the vintage comedy Ask a Policeman. Then at 4.15, Frank Sinatra stars in Some Came Running, set in a small Midwest American town in the 1940s. Tonight, Alexi Sale attempts to make sense of the insane world of food production. This is a grain mountain. We send it to the people of Ethiopia to stop them starving. And yet, in our supermarkets, you can buy these lentils grown in Ethiopia. Sex, drugs and dinner, tonight at 7.40. Part of the One World Season on BBC Two. So now, for directions to our comedy, ask a policeman. Tonight, in The Human Element, the ultimately tragic life of Austrian physicist Lisa Meitner. Albert Einstein nicknamed her the German Madame Curie. Lisa Meitner was now classified as German and Jewish. The uranium atom had split into two smaller fragments. It was at this moment that the world moved forward, as yet unknowingly, into the atomic age. The human element is given to the world of science tonight at 6.25 on 2. Now on 2, Frank Sinatra begins an agonizing voyage of self-discovery in Some Came Running. On BBC One in five minutes, Tom Hanks and Shelley Long are setting up home in Spielberg's The Money Pit. I'm looking for Josie Wales. 
Fletcher, I'm giving you a commission. Hound this whale to kingdom come. Not a hard man to track. Leaves dead men wherever he goes. I don't want to hear whales dead. I want to see whales dead. Clint Eastwood is the outlaw Josie Wales. Tomorrow at 10.20 on 2. Now on to, in a new series telling true stories from the world of science, Dr. Ruth Syme pays tribute to Lisa Meitner, a pioneering scientist in the discovery of atomic fission, the human element. I believe all young people think about how they would like their lives to develop. When I did so, I always arrived at the conclusion that life need not be easy, provided only that it was not empty. And this wish I have been granted. My name is Ruth Syme, and I teach chemistry at Sacramento City College in California. But over the last 15 years or so, I've become fascinated by someone else's life, a woman scientist who worked here in Berlin in the early years of this century. She's unusual because she went into science before women were really accepted as scientists. But her story doesn't end there. Her work led to a scientific discovery that changed the way we view science and scientists. It also involved an extraordinary relationship, one that ended in disloyalty, perhaps even betrayal. Berlin's certainly a very lively place just now. The souvenir vendors are busy selling pieces of the wall and East German uniforms, even though it has been a couple of years now since the wall came down. For Berlin, this represents a new beginning, although for my story, this really represents the end, for it's a story that finished in the rubble of wartime Berlin. But here, I hope to be able to pick up at least some of the pieces from that earlier story. There's an enormous process of cleaning and rebuilding going on at the moment in what used to be East Berlin. The first place I wanted to see was the old university, and I found it in a disheveled state. There's even a street market set up in front of it. But up until the Second World War, this was one of the great centers of learning, especially for the sciences, and it attracted people from all over the world. In 1907, a shy young woman named Lisa Meitner arrived here at the gates of this university. She had traveled here from Vienna in order to further her education in physics. She particularly wanted to attend the lectures of one of the professors here, Max Planck. Planck's insights into the laws of physics had already made him world famous. He also had some decided views on women's education. 
It was a law of nature, he once said, that women were meant for the role of mother and housewife. However, he was a fair-minded person and admitted that there might be exceptions. He gave Lisa Meitner permission to attend his lectures. What possible impression could this young woman have made upon him to make him change his mind? She came from a rather liberal, middle-class Viennese family with parents who wanted all their children to have a good education, not just the boys. Lisa spent some time preparing for the only career then open to women, school teaching. But in 1897, the University of Vienna decided to admit women. She enrolled and became one of the very first women in Austria to get a science degree. Her physics teacher was the great scientist Ludwig Boltzmann. He was engaging, energetic, warm-hearted, and Lisa Meitner always remembered his lectures as the most beautiful and stimulating that she ever heard. She came away with a vision of physics as a battle for ultimate truth, and it was a vision that she never lost. But still, the only career open to her in Austria was school teaching. So she persuaded her parents to continue her allowance for a few more terms, which would let her come and study in Berlin. Under her almost painfully shy manner, I think Max Planck recognized her determination. She came for a few terms. In the end, she stayed for over 30 years. In some ways, Berlin turned out to be a good choice. It gave her the best years of her life, and also the most bitter. I imagine Berlin could have been a very lonely place for a young woman living away from home for the first time. But Max Planck continued to be helpful. He held musical evenings at his home every week, and Lisa was regularly invited. She began to meet a number of new friends. One of these was a young chemist named Otto Hahn. That meeting was to alter both their lives profoundly. Hahn was her age, 28, and was very charming and humorous, and he genuinely liked women. He was working in an area that Lisa Meitner was interested in, radioactivity. So the two of them began working together and started looking for new, previously undiscovered radioactive substances. At the time, women were not allowed in the chemistry laboratories, so Meitner and Hahn had their own small room, which had previously been a carpenter's workshop. They found that they got along well together, and in the years that followed, they published a number of scientific papers. But Meitner's position remained unofficial. She did not get a salary. She was still living on the small allowance from her parents. But an important development occurred in 1912 in Dahlem, a quiet and leafy suburb out to the west of Berlin. The new Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Chemistry was nearing completion, and Otto Hahn was offered a post here as professor. Lisa Meitner was invited to join Otto Hahn in the new institute so that they could continue their work together. But still, she was not paid a salary. I find it extraordinary to think that after five years of successful research, Lisa Meitner was still expected to work without a salary, simply because she was a woman. Despite this, her feelings at the time were very positive. I love physics. I can hardly imagine it not being part of my life. It is a kind of personal love, like one has for a person to whom one is grateful for many things. The new building was important because their old labs had become thoroughly contaminated with radioactivity. Here in their clean new laboratories, Meitner and Hahn decided upon a terribly difficult new project. They would look for something that had never before even been detected, the mother substance 
of the element actinium. Actinium was the least well understood of the radioactive elements. From what was known of its chemical behavior, however, it was assigned to group three. The radioactive elements formed a sequence. There's radium here in group two, thorium in group four, and here in group six was uranium, the heaviest of all known elements. What was missing entirely, however, was any evidence of an element here in group five. Now, during the process of radioactive decay, elements are transformed from one into the other. There's only two ways this can happen. Either an element can move one place to the right, or an element can move to a new element two places to the left. Actinium was never associated with radium, so radium could not be the mother substance of actinium. Instead, Meitner and Hahn decided to look here, in group number five, for the missing mother substance. They started to set up some experiments to try and find the mother substance. Within a year, however, their work suffered a setback with the outbreak of war. Otto Hahn was immediately conscripted into the army. Lisa Meitner decided to volunteer as a nurse in an X-ray unit of the Austrian army. But she found the work dull, and so she returned to Berlin in 1916 to continue the research on her own. From the front, Otto Hahn wrote regularly, impatient for news, but only her letters from this time have survived. Dear Herr Hahn, the pitch blender experiment is of course important and interesting, but you must not be upset if I can't do it just yet. Believe me, it is not because of lack of will, but because of lack of time. I can't very well do as much work alone as we did together. The tedious and time-consuming chemical separations continued. Otto Hahn visited and wrote regularly. By the new year of 1918, there was progress to report. Take a deep breath before you begin reading this, for I shall tell you a variety of delightful things. The old preparation 25 is more than twice as strong. The new Giesel preparation is 30 times stronger. The increase is so strong, one notices it from one day to the next. That made me especially happy. I think you will also be glad. We can now think of publishing very soon. On the 16th of March, 1918, Lisa Meitner and Otto Hahn submitted their paper, The Mother Substance of Actinium a new radioactive element. It was, especially considering the difficulties, a terrific achievement, and it gave them great prestige. They decided to call the new element protactinium. The gap in group five was now filled. Even though Otto Hahn had been absent for much of the time, their correspondence had kept them together as a team and both considered their work to be a joint project. But one result of the discovery was to break up the team. Otto Hahn stayed here with his chemistry. Lisa Meitner was promoted. She was made a professor. She was given her own department, her own physics section here in the Institute. The 1920s were good years for Lisa Meitner. In her department, with her students, she carried out pioneering experiments on the composition and behavior of the atomic nucleus. Albert Einstein nicknamed her the German Madame Curie, and Otto Hahn was quick to admit that it was Lisa Meitner's department that brought most international recognition to the Institute. But in the spring of 1933, Hitler came to power. Students burned books in the streets of Berlin, and Jews were dismissed from German universities. Lisa Meitner had been baptized a Protestant, but she came from a Jewish family. This was not yet a problem, though, since she was Austrian and not German. I should have left in 1933, but Planck and Hahn urged me not to go, and I was so very attached to our institute. It was my life's work, and it seemed so hard to separate myself from it. 
What made it even harder to leave was the beginning of a major new scientific project, one that would need all her skill and knowledge in radioactivity. This project involved the element uranium. Uranium was, at the time, the heaviest known element. It looks like a normal metal, but its nucleus is large and unstable, and it's radioactive. But work done in Rome, which involved bombarding uranium with neutrons, had suggested the possibility of an even heavier and therefore unknown element being produced. Back in Berlin, intrigued by the possibility of discovering another new element, Lisa Meitner persuaded Otto Hahn that the two of them should once again work together. They were joined by a third person, the chemist Fritz Strassmann, as they set to work to unravel what they called the uranium problem. From 1934 until 1938, the team worked hard at the problem, irradiating uranium samples with neutrons and then trying to identify exactly what they had produced. The results were complex, but at first it seemed that they were producing not one, but several new elements beyond uranium. Otto Hahn was delighted with the discoveries, but Lisa Meitner found them hard to explain, and she had nagging doubts as to what was happening. In fact, they were very close to a discovery that would be much more surprising than anyone expected. But in 1938, Hitler marched into Austria. With the Anschluss, Austria was now part of Germany. The protection of her Austrian citizenship had gone. Lisa Meitner was now classified as German and Jewish. Lisa Meitner's diary entry of July 13th is very brief. It reads, said goodbye early to Han. Ring. Met Koster at the station. In Neuschans, the customs officer was informed. 6 p.m., Groningen. The ring mentioned in the diary was a diamond ring, a present from Otto Hahn. It had been his mother's, but he was anxious for Lisa's safety and thought that she might need it to bribe an official. Koster was a Dutch scientist, a close friend of hers, who had helped organize her escape. When Otto Hahn heard that she had reached Holland, he sent this postcard to the Koster family, using their prearranged code. Heartiest congratulations on the happy arrival of the newest member of the family. I was very happy with the news, as we had all been somewhat worried the last few days. What will be the little daughter's name? But the excitement and relief of the escape was to be short-lived. She had lost her position and her work. But that wasn't all. Events in Berlin were rapidly moving toward a conclusion that would virtually obliterate her reputation. From Holland, she went to Sweden, where a job had been found for her. But she couldn't bear to lose touch with the work going on back in Berlin. She wrote almost daily to Otto Hahn. In November, he wrote to tell her of a puzzling result. Their bombardment of uranium seemed to be yielding not a heavier element, but a lighter one, radium. Just before Christmas, she received another letter from Hahn. Our results are so peculiar that for now we shall tell only you. Our radium isotopes act like barium. Perhaps you can come up with some fantastic explanation. We ourselves know that it can't actually burst into barium. You see, you will do a good deed if you can find a way out of this. For uranium to change into radium would mean moving four places to the left. This was difficult enough to explain, but the barium result seemed ridiculous. Barium lies 36 places to the left. Either this was a mistake or something quite extraordinary was taking place. Lisa Meitner spent the Christmas of 1938 
in the small town of Kungelf in West Sweden. Among the group of friends was her nephew, the physicist Otto Robert Frisch. She had brought Hans' latest letter with her in order to discuss it with her nephew. But when they went out for a walk, something occurred to them. For some years, people had thought of the nucleus not as a hard thing, but as a liquid drop. Meitner and Frisch realized at this moment that when a neutron hit the nucleus, it could become unstable, that it might elongate. and split into two. They also realized at this moment that when it split, it would be accompanied by the release of a tremendous amount of energy. Otto Hahn's strange experimental results could now be explained. The uranium atom had split into two smaller fragments, one of which was barium. It was at this moment that the world moved forward, as yet unknowingly, into the atomic age. I am now quite certain that the two of you really do have a splitting to barium, and I find that to be a truly beautiful result, for which I most heartily congratulate you and Strassmann. The Berlin team published their exciting new results, the discovery of nuclear fission. But Hans' article made no mention of Lisa Meitner's contribution. She wrote to her brother, Hahn has just published absolutely wonderful things based on our work together. And much as these results make me happy for Hahn, personally and scientifically, many people here must think I contributed absolutely nothing to it. Fritz Strassmann was in no doubt. She had been the intellectual leader of our team, and therefore she was one of us, even if she wasn't actually present for the discovery of fission. But Hahn had begun to exclude Lisa Meitner from the discovery. For me, the work on uranium is a gift from heaven. During the war, scientists on both sides worked intensively on the practical developments of fission. Lisa Meitner was offered an important position at Los Alamos, working on the bomb, but she wouldn't even consider it. Otto Hahn was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1944 for the discovery of fission. After the atomic bomb was dropped, there was talk of revoking the prize, but this didn't happen, and in 1946, he went to Stockholm to accept it. Despite the fact that the war was now over, his version of the story remained unchanged. I find it quite painful that in his interviews, Otto did not say one word about me or of our 30 years of work together. He suppresses the past with all his might, even though he always truly hated and despised the Nazis. Probably one cannot be such a charming person and also very deep. For the rest of his life, Otto Hahn never retreated from his position. He became quite a hero in post-war Germany, and he devoted himself to the rebuilding of his country. He seemed to think he could do this best if the credit for the discovery was his, and his alone. But this did enormous damage to Lisa Meitner's reputation, damage which, I believe, persists to this day. She retired to England in 1960, coming to Cambridge to be near her nephew, Otto Frisch, with whom she had first explained the fission process. Although over 80, she still took a keen interest in scientific developments and even went to occasional lectures at the university. She also went back to visit Germany from time to time. You might expect her to feel angry towards Otto Hahn, so it's really quite surprising to learn that they remained friends for the rest of their lives. But did Han ever feel that he had done her an injustice? Did they ever... He 
really good run as she chases home the one in front. Look at that. Still years pricked. Time not fast, but certainly no disgrace. Polly and Krugerrand, a little bit slow, but also clear. Lead Chief through the finish. David Green, literally inside of home, and Duncan beginning to look a little weary. It's all about rider judgment going across country. You have to judge just how fast you can take your horse. And David probably has got it very, very close because there's not too much left. But he pricks his ears. He still wants to jump, and that's what matters. Nice piece of riding from David Green. And he's going to come right up into the frame. Somewhere around 26, 25.6 time penalty he gets and he finishes on a score of 78.8 and that's certainly going to put him around fourth or fifth with tomorrow's show jumping still to come of course we're waiting now for Helen Bell and Troubleshooter we've not had anybody jump the ha ha in one she's going between the trees she's going to do it <laughs> it is only 10 foot but it's horrific to look at because of the angles on the takeoff and landing well, for the first time, we see the lake bathed in a little sunshine. As Glen Burney comes down, he's certainly quick enough so far. He can't go into the lead, but of course, with one of those typical Ian Stark rounds, he could go pretty close. At the lake. Oh, a lovely turn. Superb piece of cross-country riding. You don't see it better than that, and that's why this man's a champion. Alfred the Great, the keeper's oxer. This horse has completed Bukalo 18 months ago with Mark. He took the ride over from Madeline then. And that's really all he's done. But Mark said he's a wonderful horse, one of the best cross-country horses he's ridden. He won't be that fit yet because he hasn't done a lot. He had most of last year off. Look at him. It's just no problem to him. So Glen Burney, the good thing about Glen Burney, he really looks very settled for him. Still strong and impressive, but not fighting, and that's the really good news. Ian, I think, could almost be enjoying his ride. Just remembers what he was like in Pakistan. Coming to the Vicarage Pond. That's the sight we like to see. Alfred the Great and Mark Todd coming. Yes, as Mark, as Mark would the fast way, even on a young horse, into the water with this man's amazing balance and extraordinary ability to set a horse forwards in balance. He will come out the straight way too and look at that. And Master Craftsman once more covering the ground quite well here, still looking very enthusiastic. Just steady him in front of the fence. In fact, Neatly over the first corner. Turning very tight. Beautiful turn. Look at that. Horse never fought her at all. Just turned with her. Well, Lorna, master craftsman, had a dressage of 50.2, was in fifth place. Now, at the moment, we've got King William leading on 55.8. And Kyber TikTok for Australia on 69. And Ginny looks set to give both of those a run for their money. Yes, she does. I mean, she doesn't appear to be going very fast, but he's a horse that covers the ground without having to look long and flat. He actually just swings along nicely in a rhythm, and she wastes so little time at her fences, just pops in, pops out, and keeps going. And Lorna, I'm sure you'd agree, what looks impressive as we see badminton bathed in rather damp sunshine, that by her high standards, Ginny's been very much under pressure, but hasn't she coped with it well? But Ginny has been under pressure, pressure for a long time and in many different occasions, and she's amazing how she not only copes with it, but she also considers all her fellow riders at the same time. I think that's one of the nicest things about Ginny. She's such a good competitor and such a good friend to everybody else. Well, one delighted Ginny Lang, and look at the score, 14.8 time penalties, no jumping penalties, they finish on 65, and that's second place. Great Britain on one and two, and Australian on three and four. And the position after cross-country, Mary Thompson maintaining that dressage lead with King William, moved up into second place now, Virginia Lang with Master Crafts, and then for Australia, Matt Ryan and David Green, United States, David O'Connor, and in sixth place, Victoria Latter for New Zealand.
Well, this morning, as always, there was the final vet's inspection to ensure the horses were still fit and well before shed jumping. Many anxious moments for some of them, of the owners and riders, as they wait for those magic words passed. And in fact, 51 did just that. Master Crossman, passed. And this afternoon, we saw a rather sad retirement. Lorna Clark, after so many years of history in the sport, she finally retired at Babington, where she was placed so often. And as a tribute to her, she led the parade before the show jumping phase. This wonderful new trophy, the Mitsubishi Trophy, awaits the winner here this afternoon. The order at the top very tight with the best going last in show jumping. Well, now the excitement really building up because here for New Zealand, Victoria Latta with Chief on 85. And that means if she has one down, she drops below Mark Todd because he had the fastest cross country score. 85 for Victoria. Vicky Latta, who uh, his dearest wish is to get to the Olympics and certainly after that performance, yes, I would have thought she's well on her way. Clear jumping here last year. And ninth and 11th in the World Games in 92. 